Okay, so for the second uh, talk of the day, we have uh, Gabor, this is fourth and last uh, yep. talk of his mini course. Okay, uh, thank you for coming. Uh, so remember, uh, we had this example uh, last time. On a, so the non T of uh, the three group. <clears throat> okay, so uh, we can see this in many different ways, but uh, I was suggesting this uh, construction where removing, doing a Bernoulli one minus epsilon uh, bond percolation and then uh, coloring uh, zero one the clusters, the remaining clusters. Uh, okay, uh, with fair coins, right? Uh, uh, coin flips. Okay, and I was asking uh, why is it uh, ergodic, hmm? right? So if it's ergodic, then it shows uh, as epsilon goes to zero, this is getting locally constant. Uh, <clears throat> so then we would uh, be converging to the, with probably with, so if this is ergodic, then with ergodic measures, we are converging to uh, the, with probability half all orange, with probability half all blue configuration, that would show that uh, this is not uh, cash dam. Okay, how do we show that this is ergodic? A very trivial question, but can you recall the definition of ergodic in this context? What yes, so any invariant event has probability. Okay, so we are on a Cayley graph. So, invariant under the action of the group by translations on the Cayley graph. Sorry? Hmm? Yeah, the action is, yes. <laughs> Sorry, yes, yes, yes. Yes, the event is on the colorings. Uh, Uh, it is mixing, but how do you prove it? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. 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 Uh huh. Uh huh. Okay. Good. Good. Um. Um. Yeah. So notice that of course it wouldn't work uh, if, uh, let's say, if you did it on a. Hmm? on some more complicated graph. Yes. <laughs> so for on Z cube, for instance, of course, or, or no, on any ZD, uh, where you have a unique infinite cluster, then, uh, uh, you know, when you do this, uh, you will see the, whether the inf unique infinite cluster uh, has, is orange or blue. And, and on an amenable graph, for sure, you could uh, measure the density. And you would see that, you know, the density of the orange would be an, translation invariant uh, uh, event, and uh, it wouldn't be ergodic. So here, so it's even mixing, uh, so you can do it. Uh, how about uh, a more complicated uh, non-amenable graph where you have different infinite clusters? Uh, can you write the sort of the, it's unclear if, it, if this uh, mixing, uh, Proof works. 
so one thing you can do, uh, so that's a beautiful uh, uh, lemma from, uh, uh, so there's a really nice paper of Lyons and Schramm, uh, 99, uh, that you can uh, measure the size of clusters in uh, many different uh, situations, for instance, in Bernoulli percolation, uh, but actually any invariant percolation by a random walk visiting frequency. So uh, invariant percolation the, sorry, the conditions I'm suddenly uh, worried about. Okay, I'm still confused. Uh, anyway, uh, so maybe ah uh, yeah yeah you don't really need ergodic okay because uh, you could okay this is something where you could go to ergodic the composition so anyway so invariant percolation uh, mu on a Cayley graph on any Cayley graph. Xn is a simple random walk on the Cayley graph. And let's say this is invariant site percolation. Uh, doesn't really matter, but uh, so just an invariant two coloring uh, of the vertices. Uh, on the Cayley graph, then for every uh, cluster, uh, C uh, of uh, of the of mu, I mean, uh, uh, in the configuration sampled from mu, the frequency started from uh, uh, O, which is the limit as n goes to infinity. 1 over n, the sum of, you know, I'm just, I'm asking if my random walk, uh, so x0 is O, and then I'm running the random walk, uh, and I'm asking uh, how often I am in, uh, in the cluster. And I take a limit. So along the trajectory, I'm measuring the frequency of my cluster. Uh, okay. Mm. The limit exists and is and doesn't depend on O. For any cluster, it doesn't depend on O. Hmm? Exists. Uh, so the limit exists almost surely. So for almost every co percolation configuration, for almost every trajectory of the random walk, almost surely. So this is the random walk started at O. Uh, this is just independent. You know, I'm doing the random walk independently of the uh, percolation, uh, almost surely and independent of O. So of course, if I gave you some arbitrary subset of the vertices, uh, not drawn from a, an invariant percolation, then uh, this wouldn't be true, right? I mean, for the random walk, you could go, you know, you could do uh, crazy things in a, uh, uh, 
in a general Cayley graph, but uh, if it's the cluster of an invariant percolation, then you can actually measure the frequency like this. Okay, so that's a, uh, <coughs> that's a very nice tool uh, in, in non-amenable. Of course, in amenable, you could measure density by uh, looking at Fulner sets and you know, inside Fulner sets, but in general, you cannot do that, but you, instead you can do this. Uh, and uh, okay, and uh, another lemma. So, you know, we don't need the, uh, ah, so here, for instance, the frequency of each cluster is what? Kind of a very similar argument as here, as, as what uh, Subhajit said. Uh, so, start the random walk. Uh, the, you know, this is an invariant percolation. So, uh, you know, the environment viewed from the particle where you are is stationary. In distribution, you are always seeing the same thing. And, uh, you know, you can prove that it's ergodic. Uh, so, you know, you, you see edges going out of you with a positive frequency. I mean, even if, so when you are walking, uh, even if for a while you are in one cluster, you see edges going out with a positive frequency. And if you take an edge like that, with positive probability on the tree, you don't come back ever. So actually, you are visiting each cluster finitely often. Uh, almost surely, so of course, the frequency is zero. Uh, okay, is that true on a more general uh, Cayley graphs. It's a bit unclear uh, at the moment. Uh, yeah, yeah. So it's a it it's a limit. Sorry, it's actually. So, so actually it's C measurable. I mean, mu measure, I don't know how to say it. C measure, is that okay? So really it's an almost sure constant. Uh, so not just, it is, it is. So it depends on C, but it doesn't depend on the random walk. So given the, for mu, so if mu is not ergodic, then you can go to the, so it's not, it's, if, if it's not ergodic, then it's not constant in mu, but of course it's completely unclear whether it's constant in C anyway. So, but it's constant in the random walk. So if mu is not ergodic, you take an ergodic decomposition for mu. Uh, and in each ergodic component of mu, it is a constant. So it is a constant, I mean, right? I mean, given it's almost surely in mu. So once I have my configuration, it's a constant that depends only on, on C. Uh, okay, maybe if I say, okay, uh, yeah, I should, uh, <clears throat> so how, so once the, so once the frequency, okay, let me say the, lem the next lemma, you know, how the, how the frequency can be used. So this is really inspired, uh, so this is in uh, our paper with Tom Hutchcroft. But uh, it's really inspired by this Lion Schramm uh, uh, paper. Is that uh, if uh, the frequency, if mu is touch, if mu is ergodic, 
and uh, uh, the frequency of of uh, of the cluster of each of every cluster is zero for every cluster and then for any uh, coloring you know any iid coloring okay by any i mean uh, so Bernoulli q iid coloring uh, uh, of the clusters the resulting uh, uh, coloring uh, which I will denote by mu q is ergodic uh, and not only ergodic but weakly mixing Okay, uh, now, <clears throat> so, <clears throat> so it's not going to be ergodic if you have some fat clusters. So if all the clusters are tiny in the sense of frequency, then what you are getting is ergodic. Now, what is weakly mixing? Uh, so one definition is, uh, uh, you know, strongly mixing would be that if you take any the two events and if you move them apart uh, then the then they are getting asymptotically independent weakly mixing is that in cesaro they are getting uh, asymptotically independent uh, and this is equi equivalent to uh, uh, to having so if you take a, a finite number of independent copies then these copies together are ergodic. So the, the, the product uh, shift is ergodic for any for two copies or equivalently for three or four or whatever. So Right. I don't know if if you have not seen this. Uh, this is a bit could be a bit weird. So if you take a, a you know on a, a you know on a, on z squared, if you take a, a with a probability a half. You are taking the uh, ergodic coloring, which is the black and white chessboard coloring with probability half this one and with probability half the other one. Uh, okay, that's ergodic. Right? It's not uh, totally ergodic, but it's ergodic. Right? It's just, you know, on, on two, two choices, you have the, uh, uh, you have only two choices. Uh, right on on the full in full you know according to all the translations it is ergodic it's not ergodic according to even translations but uh, so all translations translations it is ergodic uh, and if you two, take two independent copies of that and let's say you take the union then already with probability i don't know quarter you get everything with probability three quarters you get something else i mean two quarter you get something else with probability half you get again something else this is not ergodic anymore so if you have some uh, uh, you know highly non uh, weakly mixing uh, ergodic measure then uh, two independent copies is not going to be uh, ergodic but if it's uh, okay if it's weakly mixing that actually that's equivalent to saying that uh, putting together independent copies will be ergodic uh, <clears throat> Yes. 
Uh, okay, so that's uh, that's the lemma. And uh, okay, I'm not going to give the full proof, but uh, but it's not very hard. So <clears throat> so the claim, the main claim, is that uh, uh, if you are looking at uh, so instead of so we know that the <clears throat> <coughs> okay, so for any R, uh, if I look at uh, the limit as n goes to infinity, one over n, sum, so I'm still uh, looking at the frequency and I'm looking at the probability that uh, the R ball around the uh, x uh, zero is connected in the percolation to the air ball around x n. <clears throat> and so this is, they are in the same cluster. They are connected in, inside the percolation. Uh, so before, you know, the, the cluster frequency being zero uh, just means that, uh, you know, if I'm measuring the cluster of the origin where I started, then I'm looking at this probability without the air And I'm thinking that even if I fatten uh, my, uh, if I look at the air ball around my starting point and the air ball around uh, where I am now, even then, the pro for any R, the probability of, uh, you know, the frequency will be zero. Uh, almost surely. Okay, and uh, and why is why is uh, why is this proof of the claim? Uh, so, first, if I uh, just so for I, I want to remove this R and I want to remove this R. To get back to, to my definition, right? The, the, the cluster frequencies are zeros. Uh, so if I look at, uh, you know, so fi I have a fixed R around the origin. So it intersects finitely many clusters, this R ball. Right? It's a finite ball, it intersects uh, finitely many clusters. Uh, so, for each of them, I can start measuring the, the cluster frequency without this R. And for each of them, the cluster frequency is zero. So, even for the sum, it is zero by, uh, I don't know, Fatou's lemma or something. There's an uh, interchange between, a, well, I mean, I'm just adding M things really. So, uh, so, one over N, N equals uh, zero to N minus one. Uh, So I want that uh, Xn is in one of these M clusters, this frequency is still zero. Okay. So that's, uh, that's clear. And then uh, how do I get uh, to this one? Well, if, uh, uh, <clears throat> So, you know, I want to show that uh, uh, this is not much more likely than uh, uh, than this. So, uh, okay. So, given that I know that at time n. Uh, the air ball of this is connected to the uh, starting air ball. Uh, how can I, you know, so it's unclear how to make sure that I'm connect that even Xn is connected, right? However, you know, this means that, uh, you know, 
on the R ball, there's a vertex which is connected already to this uh, to this R ball. Okay. So this is XM. Uh, so if in my next R steps, I just walk here, then I will be in this cluster. So if I write, uh, so if I'm ready to wait R more steps, then uh, this probability is at least, you know, just, uh, you know, one over, I pay one over degree for each step. With the R power of one over degree. Hmm? Okay, so, you know, I multiply through, uh, I get that the probability of, uh, uh, of this is, you know, after a constant factor is an upper bound on that. I do the summation. Uh, okay, there is a little bit of wobbling at the end, but I'm dividing by one over n, so it doesn't matter. Uh, so, you know, you get that, uh, you know, from this, you also get that, uh, you know, the sum over this is zero. Hmm? I mean, the, the average over zero, this is zero. Hmm? Ah, sorry. This is, okay, so this is the, the, the end of the claim. The proof of the claim. Uh, and why is this useful? Uh, okay, I'm just going to, you know, an obvious corollary is that uh, if I take uh, the infimum over any two vertices for any R, the probability that the R ball around X is connected to the R ball around Y, you know, depending where X and Y are in the group, uh, you know, that probability could depend on that. However, if I know that, uh, you know, this average goes to zero, then of course it has to be small uh, quite a lot of times. So for sure, this pro connection probability is zero. The infimum of the connection probabilities for every R. Okay, and then, uh, you know, just like uh, you said, this implies uh, ergodicity, right? Because, uh, you know, so take, uh, you know, take any invariant, tra uh, translation invariant. Event A, approximate it. by some uh, A uh, R epsilon uh, event that depends only on a, only on a, the R neighborhood. Okay, this is an invariant event, so I can look at it uh, around O. Uh, it can be approximated by finite cylinders, so it depends only on uh, this finite uh, ball. Uh, and this epsilon, I just mean that the probability of uh, you know, the, the symmetric difference has small probability. <clears throat> uh, okay, and then, uh, you know, given this R, uh, I, so I can take uh, X and Y uh, so far away that uh, the probability you know, <clears throat> so the probability of a connection is already smaller than epsilon. And if the connection is smaller, if the probability, if they are not connected, then given the percolation configuration, the first percolation configuration, the, color, the, the colorings inside the balls are already independent. Okay. So, uh, so what I want to say is that the probability of A are epsilon Given, uh, okay, let me, I haven't de denoted the, co the configuration itself. So let's say omega is the, is the original configuration and omega Q is the colored configuration. So uh, 
So being connected in omega, so conditioned on omega. Uh, the probability of, uh, of this thing happening around x. Uh, and uh, you know, this thing happening around y, they are actually independent. Right? Okay, so this is zero, this difference, if, uh, if they are not connected. And so, in general, this is upper bound is by uh, maybe two times, you know, in the, in the worst case, this is, the, this is at most one, this is at most one. So if, when they are not independent, it's at most two of the indicator that uh, BRX and uh, BRY are connected in omega. So when they are not connected, they are independent. When they are connected, then it's at most two. So you have this. So you take expectation over omega. Uh, you let epsilon go to zero. Uh, you see that. Uh, you know, this thing is independent, is basically independent of uh, itself. Uh, so you get that uh, right, the, prob uh, the probability of A uh, given omega is zero or one, zero or one, uh, almost mu, mu almost surely. And, but then because mu is ergodic, it is, you know, it's always either zero or always one. Mm. Okay. And so once you know that, uh, <clears throat> okay. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> so this shows that this is ergodic, but also, for instance, uh, so that's a theorem of, uh, uh, of Lyons and Schramm in the same paper. So they had this lemma in, under, some, uh, uh, under some more conditions. Uh, so under extra conditions. Uh, but uh, for Bernoulli percolation, it doesn't matter. So, uh, so Recall that uh, so Bernoulli percolation, Bernoulli P percolation uh, on a Cayley graph, and let's say on a property T Cayley graph, on a Kajdan Cayley graph. Uh, so there is usually a PC. I mean, there's a definition of PC, right? The infimum of densities where you get an infinite cluster. And right? that's the... Uh, right? Uh, okay, there's a PU, the uniqueness threshold, which is the infimum of the P values where there is a unique infinite cluster uh, is for sure. Uh, <clears throat> now, on a tree, PU is one. You never get a, you know, if you actually do, you are doing percolation, you don't get a unique infinite cluster. There's a conjecture that uh, one-ended non-amenable uh, okay, and an amenable Cayley graph, if you have an infinite cluster, it's always unique. That's not hard to prove. On a non-amenable, you may get infinitely many 
infinite clusters. You cannot get five. That's easy to easy to see. Uh, so it's either one or infinitely many. Uh, uh, there's a conjecture saying that uh, whenever the Cayley graph is one-ended and non-amenable, PU is less than one. Okay, that's okay. That's known for uh, finitely presented non-amenable groups, but not in general. But for Kajdan groups, it's true. Uh, PU is less than one. Okay, and by the way, it's not. It's not. A, it's a highly non-obvious statement that uh, the phase diagram looks like this. So you have PC. Okay, that's positive. That's easy to see. So the number of infinite clusters is uh, zero there. It's one above PU, and it's infinite in between. So you cannot, you know, in principle, when you are raising P, it could happen that uh, uh, new infinite clusters are born and some infinite clusters uh, merge together. So maybe for a while, you know, the infinitely many clusters uh, glued to, got glued together, but then new ones are born. So maybe there is a flop, you know, maybe there are many changes between one and infinity, but no. This doesn't happen. So really what's happening is that at after PC, all the small infinite clusters are born together. And after that, they are only merging. There is no, no, no new birth. Uh, OK, that's another question. So OK, that's a conjecture that for any non-amenable Cayley graph, PC is strictly less than PU. It's known, for example, for hyperbolic groups. Uh, hopefully, two years ago, Tom Hushcroft uh, gave the proof uh, because he has this very nice uh, proof of that. Uh, but in general, that's not known. And for instance, for Kajdan groups, it's not known. Uh, okay, and so why is PU less than one? Uh, well, if PU was one, uh, that would mean that Deleting arbitrarily small density, I would get infinitely many infinite clusters. I do this coloring. So if I knew that all the clusters had frequency zero, then you can apply this lemma and you, get, uh, and you would get a contradiction as epsilon goes to zero. Okay, so I just need to know that if I have infinitely many infinite clusters, then all of them have frequency zero. How is it possible that they are not? I mean, that something has positive frequency. There are infinitely many. It cannot be the same positive frequency. So you would have clusters with different positive frequencies. Uh, fantastic theorem of Lyons and Schramm, and really the paper is called Indistinguishability of Infinite Clusters. Uh, they prove, uh, so really that's the main theorem in the paper, they prove that uh, for Bernoulli percolation and more generally insertion tolerant percol invariant percolations, whatever that means, uh, on Cayley graphs, uh, all infinite clusters are indistinguishable. All infinite clusters are indistinguishable by translation invariant uh, events. Uh, so, if so, if I tell you. Any translation invariant event, like the cluster is recurrent, or the cluster has frequency zero, uh, or the cluster has infinitely many ends, or you, you know you can you can think of many different things. Uh, of course, also the event that the cluster has size seven that's also translation invariant. Uh, so finite clusters can certainly be distinguished from each other by translation invariant events by their size. But infinite clusters cannot be distinguished. Uh, so if the frequency is positive for one, it's positive for all of them. And that's not possible if you have infinitely many uh, infinite clusters. Hmm? So it follows that this lemma that I'm just erasing now uh, can be applied, and uh, we would get a contradiction. Uh, 
uh, with the with cash density. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Now, uh, for the last part of my uh, lectures, I'd like to talk about uh, measurable cost. So there are several versions of, of cost. Uh, there's a cost of groups. There's a cost of uh, groups with of Cayley graphs, really actually on transitive graphs, you can make sense of, of cost. Uh, okay, and you can make sense of, and there is something called cost of a measure, probability measure preserving action. And there is a cost of a probability measure preserving action with a generating set. Uh, okay, and uh, so this was defined by uh, Levitt in 95, but uh, uh, Gaborio worked on it a lot. Uh, from 98 onwards. Okay, so apologies, I'm not going to define the measurable cost of, uh, of actions. You have to go to graphings and then the, just like there, are, there is a cost of graphs, there is a cost of graphings. Uh, uh, so let's forget about this. Uh, so the cost of a group is one half there's a reason for one half uh, times the infimum of average. So, okay, first I say in words. Uh, so cost is a measurable version of the rank of a group. So the rank of a group is the, you know, how many generators do you need to generate the group? Uh, so the cost of a graph is uh, what degree what average degree in an invariant way do you need so that you make the graph connected? So you want, and you want to minimize this. So you want to put invariant uh, bond percolations uh, on, the, on the group. So you want to make the group connected with drawing an, invari in an, in an invariant random graph on it. Uh, and it's invariant, so I can look at the average degree of the, the expected degree at uh, the identity, and I want to minimize that, and I take one half of it. So, uh, okay, so G, well, uh, maybe this is a bit silly to have both mu and G. Okay, let's put it like this. So mu is an invariant uh, okay, an invariant connected, okay, I don't know, invariant uh, graph, random graph on a, uh, Sorry, connecting all of gamma. Okay, let's put it like this. So it's a measure on invariant graphs uh, connect, uh, that make uh, gamma connected. Hmm? So ga gamma invariant measure on graphs.
Okay, and the graphs are on the vertices of, you know, on gamma, graphs on gamma. Yes. Yes. So, uh, okay, so one possibility is so what is a spanning tree of, uh, an in, you know, you want an invariant spanning tree of uh, gamma. So, fact, not every group has invariant spanning trees. The ones that have are called treeable. Uh, so, for instance, you know, one thing you can try is that uh, you take uh, an exhaustion uh, of your graph or group by finite pieces, by finite subsets. Inside each, you take the uniform spanning tree, for instance, or the minimal spanning tree, some random nice uh, tree, uh, let's say the uniform spanning tree, and uh, take a limit. And you hope that uh, the limit exists and it's a translation invariant measure. It does exist. It comes in two versions, the wired and the free. Uh, however, the limit doesn't have to be connected anymore, right? Because it's possible that, so, uh, right? You take an exhaustion. You take an exhaustion by finite sets in the graph. Uh, and you take the weak, you take the uniform spanning tree in a, so let's say this is G1, I mean the graph spanned by uh, the finite subset. So you take the uniform spanning tree, so, you know, it has finitely many spanning trees, take one of them uniformly at random. Uh, so you have this spanning tree. Uh, you take a, in a larger one and so on. Uh, now you take the weak limit of these measures. Uh, so what does that mean? You take some uh, finite box in your graph and look whether these, these measures converge inside the finite box. And it's possible that uh, right, in GN, uh, this, the GN is connected, but inside the box, it doesn't have to be connected. Uh, for sure, there are no cycles. In, a, in the finite box, uh, but it doesn't have to be connected. Uh, so uh, the limit is, might be a forest, might be a spanning forest. And in fact, so the limit does exist, is an invariant measure. And if I do the limit like this, uh, then uh, they converge weakly to the free uniform spanning forest of G, an invariant. Uh, a very nice invariant uh, forest, spanning forest. Uh, there is also a wired one, a wired uniform spanning forest of G, uh, which is that you are taking, doing the same thing, but uh, it, instead of in, in GN, you do it in uh, the wired version of GN, which is that instead of just cutting off all the edges that coming out of GN, you wire them in a single vertex outside. Uh, and because, uh, that because things can be connected through this wiring, uh, the wired uniform spanning tree can, has fewer edges than the, uh, than the free. So in the limit, uh, so this is also invariant, but this is actually stochastically dominated by the free. So stochastic domination. Okay, what I'm doing now is not a complete distraction. I, I, I will in a second talk about the free and the wired uniform spanning forest. Uh, okay, but you know, these are almost never connected. <laughs> so for instance, on ZD, uh, when D is at most four, this is connected. For D above five, uh, five and above, this is not connected. Uh, okay, these may be equal. So actually they are equal on any amenable uh, group. Uh, so equal on any amenable. 
uh, transitive graph, uh, not in general. <laughs> okay, so it's unclear how to take this. So if you want to make it connected, you have to be clever. Uh, and that's what is this, you know, this notion is about. Uh, okay, and the cost inside the Cayley graph, well, you just consider, you are just considering uh, uh, only invariant uh, subgraphs of the Cayley graph. Cayley graph. Okay, uh, there's a conjecture that for any finitely generated group, uh, in any finite generating set, the cost inside the Cayley graph equals the general cost. Like, you know, this would be, well, it's even worse. Maybe, maybe this, uh, the infimum overall finite generating set, maybe that is equal, but uh, like it really doesn't matter on uh, what generating set you take. And, uh, and another uh, conjecture is that uh, it actually, that, I mean, here, which I didn't define, it doesn't actually matter which uh, uh, re uh, ergodic probability measure preserving action you are taking, the cost is always the same. So that's the fixed price conjecture of uh, Gaborio. Uh, actually, it's just a question. Uh, maybe it's a conjecture. Uh, okay, so that's the definition. So several questions. Uh, okay, before why it is in, interesting? Well, it's kind of natural, I guess. Uh, but also, so let's see some examples. Uh, so what is the cost of a, a finite group? Okay, any spanning tree of this has n minus one edges. So the total degree is two times n minus one. So the average degree is two times n minus one divided by n. Uh, with the one half, it's n minus one over n. Uh, and the, for sure there is an invariant one, which, which is the uniform spanning tree, the invariant one. Uh, so, and clearly you cannot do better because you have to make it connected. So it's always at least n minus one uh, edges, at least. So the cost of a finite group is size minus one divided by. Uh, okay, cost of an amenable, infinite amenable. If one for every amenable, why? Uh, because the minimal graphs are hyperfinite. So, uh, so I could use uh, Ornstein Weiss, but uh, so there's a much easier proof by Blips. So, Benjamini, Lyons, Perez, Schramm, uh, 99. Which is a proof that amenable uh, KV graphs are hyperfinite. Uh, <clears throat> so, do the following. Uh, so, take a sequence of Fulner sets. And I will uh, actually require something on epsilon. Like uh, they should grow, go quickly. So, epsilon n should uh, decrease quickly. Uh, and uh, so what I'm doing is that uh, for each uh, uh, group element, take uh, the translated XFN and uh, close all the outgoing edges 
with uh, probability 1 over fn. So close, delete, I mean, delete from the, uh, from the Cayley graph. Okay, this is any, in, any, in any generating set. Actually, uh, with probability one over size of Fn. Okay, so for a fixed N, I'm doing this. So, you know, occasionally you have some, uh, you have some translated Fellner sets whose boundary is closed, whose boundaries are closed. Hmm? Okay. Now, what is the probability that X is closed, is contained in one of these? Well, in how many translated Fellner sets is X contained in? I don't know. Okay, anyway. Well, Fn, right? That Fn translates where, where a given X is in. Uh, and if any of them is, uh, uh, is chosen for the boundary to be closed, then X is closed off from infinity. So uh, at this stage, the probability that X is, uh, is not connected to infinity. So, you know, in the end stage, for the nth thing, that X is not connected to infinity. Uh, okay, maybe, maybe X is connected to infinity. So, you need x to be connected to infinity that uh, this one over fn didn't happen. So it's uh, one minus one over fn to the power fn. Okay. So this is basically one over e. So I do this uh, for each n independently. At each stage, you have x has probability only one over e to stay connected to infinity. So at infinitely many stages, it will be cut off from infinity for sure. So with this, uh, you know, doing this for every n independently, uh, you have cut uh, your graph into finite pieces in an invariant way. Okay. And what is the total density of edges that we have closed? Uh, so, so do this for every n independently. And uh, total, uh, dense, oops, total density of edges closed is, well, it's basically the sum of these guys. Hmm? Right at each stage, this is the, uh, this is the probability that, or maybe with the degree there is something, but it's comparable to that. Uh, so if I choose the epsilon so that this is small, you know, less than epsilon, then I have, you know, with a density epsilon of edges, I, uh, I cut my graph into finite pieces for any epsilon, so it is hyperfinite. Uh, Okay, that's the definition of hyperfinite for transitive graphs. Uh, and how do I use this to show cost equals one? Well, now I have this partition into finite pieces. Just inside each piece, take a uniform spanning tree. This has uh, average degree close to one, I mean, close to two, and with one half close to one, and add back all the, all the edges that have been deleted. That's density epsilon. So the total degree is two plus epsilon. So the cost, you know, this is for any epsilon, so the infimum cost is one. So this way, by the way, you can, you can also use this uh, finite partition to draw an invariant, uh, okay, not inside the Cayley graph, but if you just want some Z, uh, an invariant Z spanning all the, all the group, you can do that. Uh, and that's kind of a proof that, uh, 
Okay, it's not okay. No, I'm not. Well, for certain. Okay, that the group uh, that any amenable group is orbit equivalent to Z. Uh, if you translate the definitions. Uh, <laughs> Uh, okay, and uh, uh, so maybe one more thing is that it's not about, uh, so there are non-amenable groups whose cost is uh, one. So if you take any group direct producted with Z, then the cost will be uh, one. So here are your gamma copies. Here are your Z. And do the following percolation. Uh, take all these Z uh, copies uh, in, they are open, and do Bernoulli epsilon independently on each gamma copy. Uh, Okay, I have infinitely many gamma copies. So if I take any X and any Y in my group, uh, there we, so there is a path uh, in gamma, in the original gamma, there is a finite path between X and the corresponding copy of Y, uh, which is open with some small but positive probability. So among the infinitely many copies, there is some version of X and the version of Y where they are connected. So X will, you know, from X you can go down on this Z uh, to this uh, image of X, go to this uh, thing there and come back to Y. So any two vertices will be connected. And the average degree is uh, two plus uh, degree times epsilon. Uh, okay, so for small epsilon, so you get the cost is one. Uh, okay, so the, these are, ah, and uh, completely non-trivial thing, that if you take the free group on K generators, okay, if you fix the free generating set, then of course the tree can be uh, spanned as a subgraph only by itself. So obviously the, uh, the cost is K, but if you are not fixing the free generating set, it's not clear at all. Uh, so I'm, but you know, even if you try to make it you know, you cannot, so actually you cannot, you cannot succeed by less than average K. So this is a Gaborio's theorem. And really this was his uh, first motivation to look at cost because with this, he, he was able to distinguish between the three groups in this measurable context. So as opposed to amenable groups that are all the same, you know, the onskin weiss theorem says that uh, uh, they are all orbit equivalent. Uh, this actually shows that the three groups are not. Uh, okay, and... Uh, okay, however, so the, like proving, for instance, cost equals one, uh, uh, for a long while, these were the two uh, methods. Either you use hyperfiniteness or you use something like a product structure. Uh, uh, and, uh, and otherwise, cost is, is difficult to calculate. Uh, there is a related notion, which is the first L2 Betty number of a group, which is much easier to calculate. So uh, I'm not going to define it. Or actually, I, I am, but uh, so first, 
add to back the number. So the original definition is uh, there is some L2 cohomology and the first Betty number there. Uh, there are two probabilistic definitions. So one is really translating the original definition into probabilistic language, which is, uh, well, you still need something. So it's the von Neumann dimension of the space of harmonic Dirichlet. So harmonic functions with finite Dirichlet energy. Uh, okay, uh, so so harmonic functions, you know what they are on the on the on the group. The Dirichlet energy, I did define the sum of the squares of the differences on the edges. On certain uh, graphs, certain groups, there are uh, non-constant harmonic functions with finite Dirichlet energy, and others that are not. If you have one, then of course any translate is also such a function. If you want, it's a linear space. If you want to uh, measure the size, you have to sort of measure dimension with respect, you know, sort of factored out by the group action. This is what this von Neumann dimension does. This is a real number. It's positive if and only if there are non-constant harmonic directly functions. Uh, uh, okay, so that's one definition. And another definition is that uh, the expected, uh, in the FUSF, the expected degree of a vertex of the origin is two plus, this is, this two is, on, in any Cayley graph, this is the, uh, wire uniform spanning for that expected degree plus two times this Betty number. So again, so this is positive if and only if the wire and the three are different. Uh, so, and it, that's the case exactly when they are different. I don't know if I said that. So anyway, uh, so when this is zero, then the average degrees are the same. One is dominating the other, so they are the same. When they when it's positive, then they are different. Uh, okay, so uh, so this this thing, this uh, Betty number, is uh, so still it's kind of it's a little mysterious. Who are the groups where this is positive? Uh, but uh, but there are ways to calculate it because it's an L2, it's a Betty number. So there are Cunet formula and things like that. So uh, for instance, for these products, you can calculate that it is zero. Uh, and uh, so what uh, Gaborio noticed is that it's easy to see that cost is always uh, at least one plus the first L2 Betty number. And he asked if there is equality always. So we don't know. Uh, but uh, so one example where uh, the uh, first L2 Betty number was known uh, already for, for a long while uh, is Kajdan groups. So it was known that it's zero for Kajdan groups. Uh, okay, uh, yes. Uh, okay, infinite Kajdan groups. Uh, so that's uh, Becca and uh, Valet. 97. Uh, so again, that means that the free and the wire uniform spanning for us are the same. Uh, and uh, the theorem over theorem with uh, Tom Hutchcroft. From 20 uh, is that the cost is one.
Uh, am I supposed to finish in five minutes? Okay. So it's not a long paper, so proof. So first step is so trying to, right? So we want to make the whole Cayley graph. So actually in, a, in any Cayley, any, any finite generating set. I mean, for gamma is cash down. Infinite cash down. Uh, okay, so right, the, the goal is to define an invariant percolation for any epsilon where uh, the average, which makes the whole thing connected and the average degree is just two plus epsilon. Instead of that, uh, it's easier to achieve uh, want uh, an invariant tight percolation with a unique infinite cluster i don't want the whole thing to be connected i just want one unique infinite cluster uh, with density less than epsilon. But however, I want the density to be very small. So why is this enough? So imagine that you have your Cayley graph and you have uh, your unique infinite cluster inside your Cayley graph. You want, the whole, you want to make the whole thing connected. What do you do? Well, every vertex outside this one infinite piece has a finite distance uh, to this infinite piece. So, okay, maybe recursively. So there are vertices that have distance one from this thing. So maybe there are several ways of, of you know, several edges going to this infinite thing. Choose one of them uniformly at random. So I had already this. Okay, and now I take one of them uniformly at random for each one at distance one, okay? So now I have already connected things that are at distance one. Well, at distance two, they are at distance two because they are connected to distance one with finite, finite number of edges. So choose one of these edges uniformly at random. And this is already connected so this way I got connected to, right, and so on. So because everyone has finite distance, this way you have connected everyone to the blue infinite cluster. What is the degree? What is the average degree that I have used? Uh, so from, for everyone, there's a one, exactly one outgoing edge. Uh, what is the incoming, the number of incoming edges? On average, it's one. In a Cayley graph, this is true. I mean, if the outgoing is one, then the incoming average is also one. Uh, so outgoing is one. Average incoming is one. For these vertices, for these, uh, it's, uh, you know, there are no incoming or, okay, there are incoming edges, no outgoing edges. Uh, and there are these, you know, degree times epsilon. So altogether, for everyone, it's a two plus epsilon. Okay, in a Cayley graph, which is in very in a way which is invariant under the group action, this is true. So it's called the mass transport principle. Uh, your example is non-unimodular. It doesn't work. <clears throat> so, okay, if, if for, you know, if you are, so this is called the, the reason is the mass transport principle.
uh, okay. And uh, so the point is that's enough to, to produce uh, a small density unit cluster. And how do we produce this? Okay, it's a weird construction. Uh, it, actually, the story of the paper is that uh, Tom told me that I have a weird construction, but I don't know what to use it for. Uh, uh, this was in Oberwolfach while uh, playing billiards. Uh, so he told me the construction, and we talked about it, and I told him that, well, it's proving that Kajdan groups have cost one. Uh, so the weird construction of Tom, okay, actually simplified from the original one, is that... Uh, so start with a Bernoulli epsilon percolation, tight percolation, let's say. Let me call the measure mu zero. Uh, delete each cluster. with probability uh, one minus Q. You, so keep it with probability Q, each cluster. Finite, infinite, doesn't matter. For small epsilon, there are only finite clusters. Uh, get uh, mu zero Q, you know, just like our previous coloring example. Take two independent unions, union of these. So mu i plus one equals, I take one copy. Okay, I don't know if this notation is uh, it's kind of non-standard, but what I mean is that I take two independent copies and I take the union. Uh, sorry, uh, I mean, from the previous one, I get the new one and then I repeat. Okay. So what do we see? Uh, so, okay, there's a parameter Q. So choose Q depending on epsilon such that the density of mu i is always epsilon. Okay. So right, doing the thinning, reduces the density, taking the union increases the density. It's kind of obvious that you can choose Q in such a way that uh, the density remains constant. Hmm? It's an e easy calculation. You can, you know, independent things. You can, uh, you can do it. Uh, second observation, it's getting locally constant. Imagine that, you know, by taking the union, the clusters are growing. By thinning, you have less and less clusters, in some sense. So, uh, right? It's kind of intuitively clear, and you can do an easy calculation, and it is true, that uh, as i goes to infinity, uh, mu i is getting locally constant. So the probability that all your neighbor, you know, a given neighbor is in, is going to, uh, if you are in, is going to one. And if you are out, it's going to zero. Uh, okay, and we are repeating this. What happens in a Kashdan group? Uh, by the lemma that I showed you, as long as mu i has uh, okay, maybe let me write it down. <laughs> so, so as long as mu i has all zero frequency clusters, mu i plus one. Uh, uh, mu i is ergodic and has all zero frequency clusters, you can apply the lemma and mu i plus one 
is weakly mixing. Because you got it as a projection of two independent copies of some weakly mixing thing. So actually, maybe it's better to write weakly mixing here as well. A sort of that comes into the. <laughs> and so it is still, it's, and it is still ergodic. So, <clears throat> so if, if you can repeat this thing forever, then you get a sequence of weakly mixing things converging to a locally constant thing. So that can, uh, that's not good in a Kajdan group. So Kajdan implies that there is an I with a cluster whose frequency, the cluster C, whose frequency is positive. Okay, the sum of the frequencies is one, so there's a maximal frequency. Pick that cluster, that's a unique infinite uh, cluster with density at most epsilon, because we fixed epsilon. So, right, so we produced in the Kajdan group, so, uh, you know, so the probability that O is in this cluster is at most epsilon. We can do this for any epsilon, so we did this. It's, that's the proof. Uh, thank you. Sorry for the uh, overrunning. Why that cluster? Yes, so, uh, so I said it, but quickly. So the frequency, the sum of the frequencies is at most one. Uh, so if there is one with positive, maybe there are several positive ones, but you can choose the maximal one. You know, random, you know if there are more maximal ones, pick, but, but there are finitely many maximal ones. So you can pick one of them uniformly at random, and then you have your unique infinite cluster. Unique infinite cluster. Uh, thank you.